everybody. Welcome to church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on this beautiful spring morning. How glorious is it? We need to open the roof. <laughs> Let the flies in. Why not? Everybody's welcome. All right. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, as our saviour. Thank you that we stand righteous in your sight, having confessed with our mouths and believed in our hearts that Jesus is Lord. Father, we come to you boldly, asking for your, you to help us put to death those fleshly sins of what we have done and that we shouldn't have, and what we should have done but we left undone. We know that you don't change how you see us based in our actions, but we also know that sometimes it changes how we see you. We want to be as near to you as we can, safely in your arms with our heads on your chest, we surrender ourselves afresh as your children, your servants, and your people. We worship your holy, worship you, Holy Father, as we place you rightly in the highest place in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please stand as Kevin brings in our word. <coughs> from Psalm 66, and I'm going to be reading from out of verses 1 to 8. I've edited a little bit, cutting out some stuff, but I've kept the word. <laughs> Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Your enemies cringe before your mighty power. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises shouting your name in glorious songs. Come and see what our God has done, what awesome miracles he performs for people. He made a dry path through the Red Sea and his people went across on foot. Then we rejoiced in him, for by his great power he rules forever. Let the whole world bless our God and loudly sing his praises. And so we will loudly sing his praises by singing, not yet I, but through Christ in me. Please be standing. <laughs>
Would you want to come forward for the story, please? I found a video you might like. I'm going to explain a little bit first and ask you some questions before we begin. I might ask you if you know certain words. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should keep praying and not give up. I've reached a decision. The family in question is to hand over all property to the bank and pay the rest of the loan in weekly instalments for the next 20 years. Next case. Sir, have pity on a poor broken family. Pity? Puh. Next case! Have pity on my family, blah blah blah. Ha! Oh! Hello, Judge, we're neighbours. Judge, I need you to defend me. The landlord's kicking me out. He wants more rent. Uh, black coffee. Thanks. Hey, Judge! 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 Okay, okay! I'll take the case, just get out! Miserable old woman! And Jesus said, so if that's what the shonky judge did, then how much more will God get justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? She asked and asked and asked and asked and then he helped her and that's what we have to do for God. When we pray to him and we want something that we really need, it, it comes through but sometimes we have to keep asking. He's, he's always persistent with us and we're persistent with him. So now we pray for the kids. Thank you God that you say it's okay to come to you over and over again about something we need help with. Please help these kids to be able to do that. Come close to them and help them talk as they talk to you about anything and everything. Please bless them and keep them healthy and safe in Jesus' name. Amen. This first piece is the only bit that we're going to do today. So I'll play it through and then we can have a go. <laughs> so we'll learn it a bit over um, a few weeks. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll just play it slower than it normally goes, uh, so you can hear it. Oh, <laughs> 
We are going to have our offering. So if the helpers could come forward, please. Um, and if, as we do this, can we think about how God's been impacting our lives this week and how we can be prepared for God to look after us? Thank you for sharing those. By sharing our everyday lives in that way, it strengthens our faith in God to remind us, you know, because if, if we're in a rough, dry season when we're not having things happen, it sort of it waters the well a little bit and it reminds you that God's there still, you know, when he's quiet. So thank you for sharing that, everybody, even the littlest things, because God's interested in the little things, isn't he? Okay, thank you, Lord, for these things. Thank you for the offerings of the, the stories that we told of the, the, our simple lives, as well as the, the small beginnings of, of money that we've put into that um, pocket for you, Lord. I ask that you extend these things so that they can grow at like, like floodwaters going into our lives, spreading your kingdom, Lord. I pray that you empower us and the money to do your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Christ is mine forevermore. Let us stand and see.
Marty and Bob for the readings, please. And then Bob will do his turn. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. <coughs> This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Uh, the next one is Luke 18, verse 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is God's word. Timothy. And our final reading this morning comes from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. And I'm reading chap chapter 3, verse 14 to chapter 4, verse 5. And this morning I'm reading from the Revised English Bible. Now this is a version that I don't read from very often, but it does sometimes... Uh, put things in a slightly different perspective and uh, words things in a way that uh, I find um, I find fresh and inspiring and I particularly like the, uh, the way it's worded the um, first five verses of chapter four. So, starting from chapter three, verse 14, but for your part, stand by the truths you have learned and are assured of. Remember from whom you learned them. Remember that from early childhood you have been familiar with the sacred writings which have power to make you wise and lead you to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
All inspired scripture has its use for teaching the truth and refuting error, or for reformation of manners and discipline in right living, so that the man of God may be capable and equipped for good work of every kind. Before God and before Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, I charge you solemnly by his coming appearance and his reign. Proclaim the message. Press it home in season and out of season. Use argument, reproof and appeal with all the patience that teaching requires. For the time will come when people will not stand sound teaching, but each will follow his own whim and gather a crowd of teachers to tickle his fancy. They will stop their ears to the truth and turn to fables. But you must keep your head, whatever happens. Put up with hardship, work to spread the gospel, discharge all the duties of your calling. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> this morning, this morning, I want to encourage you all to keep your faith in Christ. I want to encourage you to let your faith shape who you are, to influence how you respond to people and how you think and how you view the world. I want to encourage you to listen to the advice Paul gave to the young man Timothy, to thoroughly absorb it so that it is part of your very being and to put it into practice at every opportunity. Faith is currently under attack in Australia. The number of people professing to hold no religious faith recorded in the 2021 census is the highest ever. And the number of people identifying with, as Christians is the lowest. Many people without faith accuse Christians of being intolerant, cruel, unloving and exploitative all of which are directly opposite to the values we hold as Christians. But now seems dangerous to be a Christian. You could even lose your job if you are discovered to be one. As happened to Andrew Thorburn a few weeks ago when he was forced to resign as chief executive of Essendon Football Club because he was also chairman of the City on a Hill Anglican Church in Melbourne. The club objected to comments which, incidentally, not central to the Christian faith, made in an online sermon nearly 10 years ago. That was before Mr Thorburn was chairman of their church council and which he personally does not agree with. That seems a pretty thin context for forcing someone out of a job. Are all Christians now responsible for every statement on behalf of a church somewhere at some time? I venture to say that if a person who wasn't a Christian was forced to resign from their job because someone they knew said something they didn't agree with, that someone else thought was objectionable, there would be a huge outcry. That is an extreme example. I doubt that we'll experience anything like this in Maryland. Even though some people think Christianity is evil, there are not many. An attitude that is more widespread is that faith should be a purely personal thing and that it should not be allowed to creep into your political, business or moral opinions and decisions. That, this attitude, is far more dangerous 
and we must announce it whenever we can. If you are a Christian, you are a Christian through and through. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He is the way to salvation. He is the way that we follow every day. He's the truth we hold to. And he is the life that we live. Our Christianity must permeate our whole being. There is no way that it cannot affect what we think, say and do. We believe in the God who has put his law within us and has written it on our hearts, as Jeremiah put it. More than this, we believe that in the person and the work of Christ lies the solution to all the sorrow, hurt and injustice in the world. That is why I encourage you to keep the faith and you cannot keep the faith without letting it affect your life and making it known to those around you. Over the, over the past month or so, we have heard preaching from Paul's second letter to Timothy. Timothy was a young man who accompanied Paul on some of his later missionary journeys to Macedonia and Greece and later became Bishop of Ephesus. Paul was very fond of him, perhaps because he recognised his potential as an evangelist and wrote to encourage and advise him. In the early part of the letter, on which we've heard preaching a few weeks ago, we've already heard how Paul urged him to hold fast to the faith that Paul himself had taught him, but which he'd been prepared for by the example of his mother and his grandmother, and not to become distracted by the silly controversies that only serve to breed quarrels, that even then, in the first century, was springing up in the infant church. In chapter 3, Paul warned Timothy of some of the difficulties he would encounter, and I think it's worth listening to these here. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, profligates, brutes, hater of good, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power. I suspect you recognise a lot of modern society in this list. If you recognise yourself, beware. In the passage we read this morning, Paul tells Timothy not to be discouraged by persecutions or deceived by people distorting the gospel. Instead, holding firm to the gospel we have learned, which is Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, through whom we receive our salvation. Timothy had a special gift as an evangelist. And Paul solemnly urged him to proclaim the message. We may not all share this gift. As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, while God, give, while God does give gifts to each of us, he gifts each of us differently. While some are gifted to be evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, not all are. But 
we are all likely at some stage to have to give an account of our faith. And Paul's words to Timothy about how he needs to proclaim the message applies to us all. I'm going to read uh, verses 2 to 5 of chapter 4 to you again. Because I think this is the critical part of the uh, passage for us today. I just need to find the uh, right page. So Paul says to Timothy, I charge you solemnly by his coming appearance and his reign. Proclaim the message. Press it home in season, and in season and out of season. Use argument, reproof and appeal with all the patience that teaching requires. For the time will come when people will not stand down teaching, but each will follow his own whim and gather a crowd of teachers to tickle his fancy. They will stop their ears to the truth and turn to fables. But you must keep your head, whatever happens. Put up with hardship, work to spread the gospel, discharge all the duties of your calling. Let's look at this advice more closely. First, the charge to proclaim the gospel or to give an account of one's faith is a solemn calling. It's one we must take seriously. So, be well prepared. And what can be better preparation than being steeped in the scriptures so that we may be confident of where we stand and, as Paul says, equipped for good work of every kind. Second, we should be persistent like the widow with the wicked judge and ready to give an account of our faith at any time, in season and out of season. The NRSV says whether the time is favourable or unfavourable. You never know when the opportunity to proclaim your faith or the call to defend it will arise. And when this opportunity or call comes, you do not know if you will ever get another one. So take it when you can. Third, we should use every means at our disposal to press the message home. For some people, logical argument will be persuasive. But... If not, being able to make a sound, logical case for our faith will dispel the common perception that Christian faith is irrational. Have you ever heard anyone say that believing in Christ is irrational? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but they're wrong. People will respect a thoughtful response, but they will ridicule it if it is poorly thought through. Paul's letters are full of logical arguments for the faith. But not everyone is swayed by logic. Others may respond to reproof, to having areas in their lives that need improvement or reform pointed out. But it's not enough just to point these things out. We need to be able to show how Christ's saving grace can lead to forgiveness and reform. But, another but, we must pray for wisdom in knowing which approach is appropriate in each case. The use of reproof, for instance, could be counterproductive in cases where people haven't yet recognised their imperfection 
and we run the danger of being branded as hypocrites. Finally, you must be patient. Not everyone learns or understands immediately. Sometimes people might have objections we haven't thought of. We must be respectful of those who, after all, God loves as much as he loves us. Although Paul warned Timothy that the time would come when people would not respond to sound teaching, that does not mean that they are stupid and it does not help if we get angry with them. Paul advised Timothy to keep his head whatever happened and we would be well advised to do the same. So, to sum up, the Christian faith is not fashionable in Australia at the moment and it's under attack. Perhaps some of this is deserved, but we know, we know the core message of love, forgiveness and redemption is as critical now as it has ever been. And we have an obligation to make sure people hear and understand it, whether it's through our own lips or others. I urge you to heed Paul's advice to Timothy. Be firm in your faith and your understanding of it. Always be ready to give an account of it because you never know when you will be called upon to do that. And when you do so, do it in a respectful way appropriate to the situation. Don't be discouraged if people don't respond in the way you think they should or in the way you would like them to. But be persistent and be patient. You can't do much more than that. Amen. Lord, we thank you that until we all gathered in your name, you were there amongst us. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to pray to you, to the people that are on our hearts. For you know what's in our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because you have died for us. You died for our sins and for, and for our health. So, Lord, we ask you to hear our prayers. Be with us. Be with the people we pray for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
guys, so we're going to go up in the air or? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We will stay standing as Kevin takes the Bible out before us into the week, please. to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. The elders are available if you need any prayer and join us for a cup. Be blessed. Have a great week.